Evet değerli misafirler. E, İbrahim Bey'in konuşmasında altını çizdiği e, birkaç nokta önemli. Öncelikle neden sorusunu sorabilmek. Şimdi insanoğlunu doğada diğer canlılardan ayıran birkaç özellik var. Şimdi eşrefi mahluk olarak baktığımızda başka bir şey ama örneğin biz dünyada üstüne bir şey giyinmek zorunda olan tek canlı türüyüz. Bilmiyorum dikkatinizi çekti mi? Hani ceketli bir aslan, bereli bir zürafa falan böyle şeyler doğada yok. Ee, Birçok alanda aciziz doğal şartlar açısından baktığımızda ama e, bu eşitsizliğimizi gidermek adına bir sürü formül bulmuşuz. E, mesela e, adaleti sağlamak için hukuk bunlardan birisi değil mi? Doğanın hukuku bizim hukukumuz gibi işlemiyor. Bir canlı acıktığı zaman av e, ekosisteminde olan diğer bir canlıyı yiyor. Ama mesela hayvanların hukuku olsaydı bir aslan ceylanı avlamadan önce bir gerekçeli karar belki açıklamak zorunda kalacaktı vesaire. Ama bugün baktığımızda geleceğe yönelik evhamlarda, endişelerde ki biraz önce de bahsedildi ya makinalar bir şeyleri devraldıktan sonra insanda ne kalacak? Moral değerler kalacak işte ahlak olacak belki din olacak vesaire bu gibi kavramlar olacak. Zaten bence korkunun esas gerekçelerinden bir tanesi de bu. Bilmiyorum hafızalarınızda taze mi? Microsoft bir yapay zeka e, botunu Twitter'a bağladı. İsmi de Tide, Microsoft Tide diye bir hesapla 12 yaşındaki bir e, kız çocuğunun e, bilgi seviyesinde, zeka seviyesinde bir algoritmaydı bu ve dedi ki alın bunu yazışın, konuşun, eğitin, işte onlara bir şeyler öğretin diye. 24 saati dolduramadan Microsoft kapatmak zorunda kaldı. Çünkü bir anda korkunç, ırkçı, cani, felaket Twitter mesajları yazmaya başladı. Kurumsal iletişim tarihine ilginç bir sayfa olarak yansıdı bu yapay zeka. Yani biz dünyaya melek gibi indirilmiş bir yapay zekayı sadece 20 saat içerisinde bir canavara dönüştürebilme kabiliyetine sahibiz. Dolayısıyla önümüzdeki devirlere ait düşünmemiz gereken şey... Aslında makinaların ahlakı değil, o makinaların düğmelerini, kollarını, işte bilmem yazılımlarını ve algoritmalarını elinde tutacak, onları şekillendirecek insanların ahlakı. Dolayısıyla teknoloji bize çok steril, çok vaatkar bir gelecek sunuyor. E, fütürist bakış açısıyla ele alındığında bunun işte aydınlık ve karanlık geleceğini öngörebiliyoruz. Ama bence pek konuşmadığımız arka planda insan olarak kendi tarafımız. Yani biz teknolojiye yönelik bütün korkularımızda aslında bilinçaltında kendi ırkımıza, kendi türümüze ait korkularımızı dile getiriyoruz. En e, üstünde emek harcanması gereken yine insanlar olacak. Dolayısıyla bu konuların konuşulması bence her zamankinden daha önemli. E, şimdi ilk e, konuşmacımızı davet etmeden önce bir küçük hatırlatma yapıyorum. E, yapmak istedim. Bilmiyorum buna gerek var mıydı ama... E, malum konuşmacımız e, yabancı. Dolayısıyla e, sunumu da yabancı dilde olacak. İngilizce e, konusunda belki desteğe ihtiyacı olanlar olabilir. E, kulağıma da simultane tercümenin gürültüleri geliyor ama eğer e, tercümeye ihtiyacınız varsa kulaklıkları hemen dışarıda takdim ediyorlar. E, almanızı da tavsiye ederim. Bir küçük hatırlatma daha. E, konuşmacılarımıza sormak istediğiniz sorular iletmek istediğiniz yorumlar olabilir. E, koltuklarınızda bulunan dosyaların içerisinde soru kartları var. Buna aklınıza gelen soruları yazıp e, elinizi kaldırarak gösterirseniz e, havada tutarsanız arkadaşlarımız bunları sizlerden alacaklar. Sonra tasdif edecekler. E, sunumun bitimine yakın bana verecekler. Sonra biz burada sunumdan sonra 15 dakikalık bölümde Sizlerin yönelttiği soruları burada muhataplarıyla, konuşmacılarımızla ele alıp cevaplamaya çalışacağız. Bu da aklınızda bulunsun lütfen. Diyerek <gülüyor> e, ilk konumuzu ben takdim ve davet etmek istiyorum. Kendisi 15 yıl IBM'de çalıştı. Burada 270'ten fazla e, ödül aldı. Colorado'da yaşamakta olduğu e, şehirde kurmuş olduğu Da Vinci Enstitüsü'nün de ee, geleceğe yönelik çalışmalar ve perspektifler ortaya koymaya çalışıyor. Ee, bugün de e, bizimle birlikte e, burada e, sunumunu gerçekleştirecek. Geleceğin ülkesi e,
sosyolojik trendleri ve bir köprü olarak Türkiye başlıklı konuşmasını gerçekleştirmek üzere Thomas Frey'i alkışlarınızla sahneye davet ediyoruz. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here with you in Istanbul today. Every time I get a chance to come here, I, I absolutely want to come here. This is a city with great energy. It's a country with great possibilities. And I think you're on the edge of something tremendous that's going to happen here very soon. What I'd like to do is start off taking you through um, a scenario in the year 2020. Now, this is just a couple years in the future, so it's not very far away. But let's start off with, uh, uh, in 2020, the Norwegian Nobel Committee decides that they want to hold a new type of election, and they want to select the winner of the no Nobel Peace Prize. So they want to hold a global election and allow the people of the world to decide who the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize should be. So part of, part of their process is they want to inspire a new age of peace and they want to use this process to inspire peace around the world. So they start with a panel of four nominees. Now they select the four people to start with and then they announce it 60 days before the election and it's a 24-hour election cycle, and people can vote with any number of uh, devices, their, their phone, their tablet, their computer. Now, because this is part of the peace mandate, they want people to know more about uh, the candidates and just select the name off the list. So they, they pre-test the voters. Now, in an electronic election, they can do this. They can pre-test people. Now, they don't want to trip people up, so they, they ask them uh, two questions about each of the candidates. It's not designed to, to make somebody miss it or something. They give each person four attempts to get it right, but they just want people to know something about each of the candidates. This is their process for promoting peace around the world. So in the end, the winner gets announced after the 60-day period. And 740 million votes get cast from 163 different countries. And then suddenly the winner becomes the most famous person on planet Earth. So then the question becomes, is that a realistic scenario? Because when I make a prediction, it's intended to force you to think about the future and come to your own conclusions. So is that a realistic scenario? In what other ways is this going to be used? Well, if it seems like it's really far out there, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame used a blockchain type voting system like this in January of this year, and they had 1.8 million votes cast to select the new inductees into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. So then you think about what are some of the other possibilities for this type of technology? Well, it could be used to select the Time Magazine Person of the Year, maybe the, the site of the next Olympics, or maybe the site of the next World Cup, but then things probably are gonna go wrong. Things always go wrong with technology. Um, somebody's gonna decide they wanna select a new world leader. Yeah, what can go wrong there? Uh, voting on who owns the moon? Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. And then voting on the ownership of an island or some uh, position like should we ban plastic bottles all over the world? There's any number of issues that will start coming up. This is a new type of technology that opens the door for an entire new industry. But the question that I like to ask is at what point does the number of votes constitute a new global mandate? See, this comes into play with uh, something like in uh, Caledonia and Spain right now rather than having to guard the voting boxes if they all voted electronically, um, they would get the results one way or the other. But we end up being a very backward-looking society. We're backward-looking because it's just human nature. See, we've all personally experienced the past. 
As we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. In fact, all information we come into contact with is essentially history. So the past is very knowable, and yet we're going to be spending the rest of our lives in the future. So it's almost as if we're walking backwards into the future. My job as a futurist is to help turn people around, to give them some idea of what the future might hold. But how does the future get created? Well, the future gets created in the minds of everybody around us. We all participate in creating the future. But I use this phrase quite a bit, the future creates the present. This is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is somehow going to create the future. But from a little different perspective, it's these images that we hold in our head determine our actions today. So here's the key thing. If we change someone's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. So that's my promise to you, is that before the end of this morning, we're going to change your vision of the future, and as a result, you will walk out of here making other decisions. If I don't do that, please hold my feet to the fire. Uh, I'll try harder. I get asked a lot if I have a crystal ball, and yes, I do have a crystal ball. It was sitting around at home, and my wife says, why don't you just take this to the office? So I put it in the car, and I was driving down the road. It was no more than four or five minutes down the road. I looked over, and I saw that my crystal ball had started a fire on the seat next to me. This is the sun shining in. This is a giant lens. Um, it was a little science experiment happening on the seat next to me. I should have known better. Uh, luckily, I was able to put the fire out, and it didn't cause any serious damage. Uh, but then I had this giant revelation the next, uh, afterwards, and the revelation was is that um, the newspaper headlines the next day were going to say, Futurist killed by his own crystal ball, and he never saw it coming. So that's my disclaimer. I don't see everything. Um, as Larry Page says, the main reasons companies fail is because they miss the future. We get blindsided by a lot of new technology, and that's a lot of what's happening in the world today. Now, when I talked about a global election process like this, um, this is a, what I refer to as a catalytic innovation. This is different than disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation disrupts existing industry. Catalytic innovation creates entire new industries. So some examples of some of the ca past catalytic innovations are things like electricity, automobiles, airplanes, photographs, telephones. All of these things went on to create multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar industries. But here's the thing. All industries are essentially a bell curve. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And yes, all industries we have today will eventually end. A thousand years from now, every industry today will have been replaced multiple times. The other important part is that all the important industries today, the ones that are most lucrative industries that are making the most money off of, are in the second half of the bell curve. They're constantly being forced to do more with less. <clears throat> so in 2012, I was speaking at a TEDx event here in, in Istanbul called TEDx Reset, and I made the prediction that by 2030, over two billion jobs will disappear. Now this is a, a real important turning point for me because this is um, a prediction that I still get quoted on in newspapers, magazines, and television stations literally all over the world. Now this was never intended to be a doom or gloom statement. It was never intended to say that somehow we're gonna have two billion people unemployed in the world. It's intended to be a wake-up call because we're going to have to create jobs at a faster rate than ever before. This is what I refer to as, as the level problem. Now, a lot of us have this tool in our house, in our garage. We use it to hang pictures straight. We use it to do carpentry work. But once we download a level app, we no longer need to buy that tool. <clears throat> now, that means that we don't have to have as many people making the aluminum frame or making the glass bulbs. We don't have as many people doing the assembly work, the shipping, the receiving, the retail stores that are handling that. 
Every time we download a mobile app, we eliminate a piece of a job. It's a very tiny piece, but when we download billions upon billions of mobile apps, we start to eliminate a serious number of jobs. Oxford researchers looked at this, this problem a couple of years ago, and they concluded that with 700 different occupations, that machines are going to take over 47% of those jobs. Coincidentally, that works out to around 2 billion. So thank you, Oxford. That was nice. The key thing to remember, though, is that we're not automating jobs, entire jobs, out of existence. We're automating tasks out of existence. So a lot of the jobs that we had in the past, parts of them are going away. So the job itself gets redefined. And while the job itself and title is still there, we end up using different tools to do it. On one hand, we're eliminating jobs. On the other hand, we're freeing up human capital. But just because our jobs go away doesn't mean we're running out of work to do in the world. That's, that's pretty ludicrous. Um, obviously, there's lots of work left to do in the world. But will there be jobs lined up for all the work that needs to be done? That's a whole different question. So uh, we're going to have some nasty gaps there. For this reason, I wrote the three laws of exponential capabilities. Uh, I'll go through these quickly here. The first law is that with automation, every exponential decrease in effort creates an equal and opposite exponential increase in capabilities. Um, I'll explain what that means here. In 1850, the average transportation speed around the world was roughly six kilometers an hour. And over a lifetime, somebody would travel roughly 110,000 kilometers in their entire life. And then in 1900, we started having a few cars and trains, uh, horse and buggy. The average speed went up to 12 kilometers an hour. And then in 1950, up to 36 kilometers an hour. In 2000, because so many people were flying, we got up to 110 kilometers an hour on average. And if we're following that trend line, then by 2050, we should be reaching 200, 335, 340 kilometers an hour, and over our lifetime, 11 million kilometers in our lifetime. So we went from 110,000 kilometers to 11 million. How are we going to get there? Law number two, as we raise the bar for expectations, we, or for our achievements, we also reset the norm for our expectations. And number three, uh, as today's significant accomplishments become more common, mega accomplishments will take their place. And I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about mega projects toward the end here. So we can now think faster, know faster, and do faster than ever before in history. So where's our next generation jobs going to come from? Well, they'll come from future industries. So when I talk about future industries, I usually focus on what I refer to as the disruptive eight. Now, there's probably more than just eight. Um, these are the ones that I focus on, though. And I'll just basically focus on a couple of these today. Um, each one of these, if we think about the internet and how it developed over the 80s and the 90s, it created this entire new platform for creating new industries. And then smartphones came along 10 years ago and they really created another new platform for creating new industries. Now we have eight different platforms creating new industries over the next couple decades. Uh, and after that, we'll probably have 64 more. Um, it, it grows exponentially. So I attended, about a month ago, I attended the, the Future of Drones Congress in Brisbane, Australia. And they asked me to speak about the future of drones because of a, a recent article I'd written on 192 future uses for flying drones. Now, I started off that column talking about this question I had in my head where I was thinking about if I added a video projector to a drone, what additional capabilities would that give me? And I started thinking about that and I thought, well, maybe it would give me the ability to create um, uh, some interesting visuals in an art show, maybe a concert. And then it occurred to me that if we put a video projector on a drone, that we could fly it around in front of somebody and actually project ads or messages directly in front of that person. So if we have a wealthy person, this could become the most annoying form of advertising ever invented. And then I started asking, well, every 
feature gives drones additional capabilities. So what if we added things like uh, maybe we added speakers to a drone or microphones? What capabilities would that give me? Maybe infrared filters, sensors? How about if we add a robotic arm to a drone? What capabilities does that give me? Maybe we add lasers to a drone. What can I do with that? If we add wheels to a drone, then it's rolling on the ground as well as flying in the sky. How about if we we're, we're flying, uh, flying a drone overhead as we want to go jogging at night? Or what if we add a tow line to a drone? What capabilities does that give me? It's like fun, doesn't it? How about if we, if we want prankster drones? We can have, um, or maybe this one here, flying out of a prison. That one's a good one. We're, we're talking a lot about delivering things with, with drones. And so this is a, a delivery system. Amazon had their first commercial delivery in December last year. But as we, as we look at it, it's, it was very simple landing in a field where there's no obstructions or anything. There's lots of problems with, with flying delivery drones. So my thinking is we're going to have a lot more that are delivery drones that are on the ground, like this one here. that she was going to have a package delivered and then recognized her and it dropped it off on her sidewalk. I think that's more complicated than it has to be, but um, Switzerland's actually looking at postal delivery with drones and they're, they're trying to explore possibilities there. Um, one of the big problems with drone deliveries is, is where is it okay to leave the package? Um, if I'm in an office complex, if I'm in an apartment building, um, where is it okay to leave that package? Um, we, I was working with an inventor ten years ago and he had come up with an idea of actually use, creating a bench like this that was a delivery box so then when a package was being delivered it would open up and you could put your packages inside of it. So drones are going to be used for lots of different things. The emergency rescue drones, see we have the ability to put out fires completely. Fires are very easy to put out when they're this big, but once, once a fire gets started, if it turns into a giant blaze like this, it's very difficult. But when we spot it early, we can have drones that are flying overhead that can spot these things, and they, then we can call in the fire extinguisher drones to put it out right away. This is actually a drone that's putting out fires with sound rather than uh, with water or some chemicals. Cities in the future, whenever an emergency call comes in, their first response will be to get eyes on it. They'll send up drones to find, find out how to formulate a response. Uh, emergency rescue, whenever there's an avalanche, send out a drone rather than lots of people that can get in harm's way. News organizations are going to be uh, very aggressive, trying to be the first ones to get live coverage of, of some situation. And eventually, the news organizations will send out interview drones that will fly up to people that are close by an incident, and they will start having conversations with the news anchor and that person, and will get live interviews just minutes after something has happened. Emergency puppy rescue, that's a good one. Um, drones are going to be used for agriculture a lot. We can monitor crops that are a thousand kilometers away. Um, even on the other side of the planet. We can apply herbicides and pesticides. We can do a few scans over a field and tell what the fertilizer content is, if there's any diseases or moisture content in the soil. Um, we can monitor livestock. Um, it's very easy to use drones to inspect the top of windmills, the places that are hard for people to get to. 
Um, also inspecting power lines, places that are very dangerous for people to, to come into contact with. We can do thermal scans on buildings very easy. Uh, structural integrity, we can find out if things are gonna stand up in the future. We can monitor construction projects going on in the other side of the planet. We can use emer emergency medical drones whenever something happens, goes wrong on a golf course. We can even call in a defibrillator to shock somebody back to life. If there's a giant incident where a truck catches on fire like this, rather than having an ambulance go through the traffic, we can fly an ambulance in, and these flying ambulances will be able to get there in far less time and provide emergency service. We're gonna use drones for environmental cleanup. The oceans are getting very polluted. And rather than having people do it and people needing bathroom breaks and having to sleep at night, these drones can work 24 hours a day cleaning up our oceans. This one here, <clears throat> this one here is like a giant vacuum cleaner that will suck all the plastic out of the ocean. So we need to understand the full spectrum of drones. We're going to have drones that are the real high-flying ones that fly right at the edge of the atmosphere. Uh, Airbus, Google, Boeing, and Facebook are all working on this problem. Their stated goal is to provide the internet for the, the other three billion people on the planet. But they're gonna be used for lots of other things besides that. We're also gonna see drones that can actually move shipping containers. These are the real large ones, and, and there's talk about being able to move entire houses with a drone, this, in this case a houseboat. And the very tiny drones, the ones that are so tiny that we have to keep our windows closed in the summer because all the drones will get in the house. If we assume that sometime in the future there will be 50,000 drones flying over the city of Istanbul on a daily basis, what is the city's responsibility in dealing with and managing all these drones? What are the legal privacy barriers that will protect people from the drones? We haven't decided any of these rules yet. So who has the right to shoot a drone out of the air? And at what point do we have an obligation to shoot a drone out of the air? We haven't made any of these decisions yet. We haven't had these discussions. So, what, who is it that gets to decide if a drone is being helpful or menacing? Are they causing problems or are they just, is this one here just trying to get the trash off the power lines or are they actually trying to ruin the power lines? <clears throat> In the future, we're gonna have drones that scan over cities and we're going to be able to create search engines for the physical world. So we'll be able to search on things that are far more complicated than anything that we can search on today. I want something that smells like this. I want something that tastes like this. I want this barometric pressure, this harmonic vibration, this level of reflectivity, this texture. We won't know what all these attributes are that we're searching on, but the search engine will figure out the request and will find the information for us. So in the future, we're going to have drones that are scanning cities on a regular basis and we'll be able to create models of that city and they'll get more elaborate over time. And then we'll be able to ask some very detailed questions like, did that tornado cause, cause damage to City Hall 20 minutes ago? What was the, where is that rabies infected dog right now? What is the heaviest traffic intersection in the city? What caused the fire at 22nd and Oak Street? Um, if we have problems with this, this guy and this lady, um, how close have they been in the last 24 hours? In infrastructure reports, what is the most dangerous bridge in the city today? We can find out all this information with the search engine, with the drones that are providing that information to us. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs that'll go away with this. Uh, surveyors, delivery services, search and rescue, policemen, firemen, power line inspectors, security guards, cameramen, videographers, news reporters. 
But at the same time, we're creating lots of new jobs. Things like uh, drone command center operators, data, data analysts, drone pilot trainers, uh, operator certification, privacy monitors, uh, traffic optimizers, drone standard specialists, and environmental minimizers, the ones that watch out for how much noise they're creating or pollution, visual aesthetics, that sort of thing. The most important job will be that of the snot bot operator. Uh, drones are being used to analyze um, all the emissions from the blowholes of whales, and uh, so that's one, one possible job in the future. We're going to start seeing drone command centers crop up. And what are these going to look like? Is every city going to have one? Is every police force going to have one? Um, this whole market for drone command centers is going to explode over the coming years. Um, every sports team, every news organization, every airport, every college campus, all the stadiums, the national parks, ski resorts, uh, shipping docks, theme parks, all of them are going to have their own fleets of drones. So what will a drone command center look like in the future? We can only guess. How long before we reach the first billion drones in the world? It'll be sometime between 2030 and 2032. That's coming up right around the corner. To me, the number of drones is far less interesting than what we can do with all these drones. And that's what we were just talking about. But keep in mind, drones don't just fly in the air. Drones can also roll on the ground. They can stick to the side of a building. They can float in a river. They can dive underwater. They can jump onto the side of a building. I've seen them jump onto two-story buildings. They can climb a tree. They can attach themselves like parasites to the sides of train ships and airplanes. In the future, all the drones will have multiple capabilities. And it's important to understand that driverless cars are also drones. So I wrote a column recently on the topic of driverless cars and 128 things that will disappear in the driverless car era. And, uh, and it's, it's quite amazing once you start actually working our way into this space. So if you can imagine 10 years from now, stepping out in front of your house, you pull out your smartphone, you punch in, I want to go to work, I want to go to school, I want to go shopping. A driverless car comes and picks you up, takes you to where you want to go, and from there it picks somebody else up and takes them to where they want to go. We transition from a just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to a just-in-time mindset, I can summon a vehicle at any time that I need it. Right in that line of thinking is one of the most disruptive lines of thinking in the entire world. Driverless technology will be more disruptive than the invention of the wheel. It will be more disruptive than the invention of electricity or even the automobile itself because it will affect more people in a shorter period of time than any else, anything else in all history. To give you an idea of how this is maturing, this is the autonomous car Hyundai introduced in January in Las Vegas. Volvo is testing cars um, in Sweden this year. Ford is testing them in Europe. General Motors is testing them on snow and ice conditions. BMW has formed a consortium with Intel and they're testing them. Uh, this is Google's self-driving car company called Waymo. Baidu, the big search engine company in China, is testing driverless cars. And this is VW's model called Cedric, which was introduced at the Geneva Auto Show just a couple months ago. Um, now, as I look at this, this is a very boxy looking car, but in my mind, this is what more of the driverless technology is going to look like, as we have to worry a lot about people getting in and getting out of these vehicles. And in the future, we're going to worry far less about what they look like on the outside and far more about what we can do on the inside. And Elon Musk says that he will have a self-driving Tesla before the end of the year that will drive all the way from Los Angeles to New York with no human intervention. That means thousands of miles it will stop and recharge itself. Um, this is where Tesla's driverless cars are right now. So 
So if you see the guy with his hands on his lap there, the very nervous guy there. Um, see, we're going to have to develop a level of trust with this technology, and that's not going to come instantly. But over time, driverless cars have the potential to get as safe as the airline industry. And the airline industry is actually the safest form of transportation in the world today. There are 263 companies that have actually staked their future on driverless technology. So this is not just the whim of a few companies. There's a lot of effort going into this. As, as this is happening, lots of things are going away. Taxi drivers, Uber drivers, courier jobs, truck drivers, all of these start to disappear. Valet jobs going away. Rental car agencies going away. Auto insurance is going to dwindle and disappear. Auto auctions, loan underwriters, even the dealerships start to disappear. Um, taxi uh, crash test dummies are going to disappear. Volvo has announced that by 2020 that they're going to start making death-proof cars. Now, as we baby step our way into the driverless era, we're going to start adding lots of collision avoidance features. And whether or not Volvo actually approves a completely death-proof car by 2020, I certainly applaud their effort. <laughs> Lots of businesses are going to go away. The car washes, the gas stations, the oil change business, tire shops, brake shops. All of these things start to disappear. Service stations, gone. Emissions testing, gone. Parking lots start to disappear. A lot of high-priced real estate will come up to grab once parking lots go away. Parking garages, parallel parking, parking meters, charging stations, all of these things start to go away. Now, in the United States, 86% of the cars on the road have just one passenger in the, in the vehicle. So as, as we move into an era where most of these cars are in fleets, and somebody owns these fleets, the fleet owners are going to have a tremendous amount of influence on how cars are designed. And very likely, we will see one-person vehicles designed for the driverless era. Um, as parking lots go away, we start to reinvent buildings and create queuing stations in front of them so that we'll have cars queued up whenever somebody goes in or goes out of that building. Um, it looks like electric cars are going to dominate because uh, the, the battery... Life is getting so much better very quickly. And we're going to start seeing the first highways that are designated as driverless only sometime between 2030, 2035, somewhere in that time frame. You can only pull your car onto these roads if you can move it into a driverless mode. Now here's where it gets interesting. The life expectancy of a vehicle is um, uh, roughly one year maybe. Um, if you're picking people up and dropping them off 24 hours a day, a car can actually put on easily you know, 1,000 kilometers, maybe 1,500 kilometers in a single day. And then over 10 months, then that will have 300,000 kilometers on a single car. Um, one autonomous car will replace 30 traditional cars. And and we did some math on this in the United States, and this might be roughly in some of the other places too, but it'll take just 15,000 cars to replace 50% of peak commuter traffic in a, in a city of a million people. Um, now it might be slower here in Istanbul because the traffic will take a while to get that under control, but, um, but that's roughly the formula there, 15,000 cars for half of the peak rush hour traffic for a million people. Airports are going to be uh, transitioned quickly. 41% of revenue for most airports roughly comes from parking and transportation services. All that starts to go away. So airports are going to have to look for other revenue. And then we'll have to decide what to do with all these giant parking lots at airports. Um, we have lots of distracted driving right now. People are texting all the time. Um, in the United States, we spend right at half a trillion dollars a year repairing people after car accidents. We spend way too much money fixing people after car accidents. That all has the potential to go away. Now, when I talk about the driverless car era, this happens over the next 
two to three decades. It doesn't happen instantly. Um, so this is roughly one out of every six dollars in the US, US healthcare industry right now. Cities stand to lose roughly 50% of their income stream. Um, lots of things are changing and cities are, are not prepared for all the things coming down the pipe. So teenagers will be some of the early adopters for driverless technology. Parents are actually going to encourage it. But, but with teenagers, things go wrong. I mean, how can things go wrong with teenagers? Um, at what age is it okay for a child to drive in a driverless car by themselves? So if you create a, a system that recognizes a parent on one end and a teacher on the other end, can you put a six-year-old child into a driverless car to go to school by themselves? And then for how long? Because things go wrong. The child gets sick, sometimes you have hailstorms, sometimes you have other things that happen. We haven't had any of these discussions yet. We need to start talking about some of the possibilities here. This is what an intersection will look like in the driverless car era. Looks pretty crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> so Airbus, um, uh, some of you have probably seen that in Dubai, they, they had the first drone, drone taxi flight um, uh, a couple weeks ago. Airbus says that they're going to have drone taxis for sale next year. And I'll show you a quick video. This isn't what they're going to come out with, but it's quite a fascinating approach to thinking about drone taxis. My favorite physicist, Max Planck, likes to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So contour crafting is a form of 3D printing for the construction industry. This is large scale 3D printing. I'm going to show you a quick video on uh, a project that was done in Russia earlier this year. small house that they created but for a very inexpensive price and they did it in, in less than a day. This is a, a project in Japan. Uh, the architect is, is actually promoting the idea that people can design their own unit on the ground. It gets 3D printed on the ground and then a crane is used to lift it into place into this building. It'll be fascinating to see what this looks like when it's all complete. But this is what people are thinking about. They're thinking about, in a construction site, we'll be able to set up a rig, and in less than a day, we'll be able to 3D print the entire building. And so 
as this technology improves, we're not just printing the structure, we're also printing the wiring in the walls, the plumbing in the walls, the cabinets in the kitchens, the toilets, the sinks, even the, the roof and the insulation and the windows. We'll be able to print all of that all at once. And so in less than a day, we'll be able to completely build an entire house. Now what this means then in the future is if we get tired of our house, all we have to do is just grind it up and reprint it. We don't even have to clean it first. We can just reprint it. Once we're able to 3D print our buildings, we no longer have the need for flat walls. Every wall can become an artistic centerpiece. Architects are going to go crazy with all the freeform structures they can create. Our very definition of what a house is, what a condo is, what an office is, all of that's going to start to change once we have these new capabilities. As William Gibson says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Now I promised you that I would talk about mega projects here and this is something I think that you sh at the chamber here should start thinking about in the future. Uh, by 2030, we're going to see more changes to core infrastructure than in the combined total of all human history. So infrastructure is going to go through some amazing transitions here very soon. I'll first start off talking about four global bridge projects. Um, the first one is across the Bering Strait, then the Darien Gap that connect North and South America, then the Japan-Korea Friendship Tunnel, and then the, the um, Gibraltar Bridge Tunnel that connects Europe with Africa. The Bering Strait one, this can either be a bridge or a tunnel. Uh, if we look at how this is set up, there's two islands in the middle, one's on the Russia side, one's on the US side. Um, while it's a huge engineering feat, it's not impossible. And so again, this can go above ground or below ground. The Darien Gap, um, in 1937, they, they started this, what's called the Transamerica Highway, and it went completely from North America down to South America, except for this one little section between Panama and Colombia called the Darien Gap. It's a very environmentally sensitive area. Uh, it's not that far. It can be tunneled around uh, or bridged around through the ocean or something. Uh, the Japan-Korea Friendship Tunnel, um, there's islands in the middle. Again, this is uh, a major engineering feat, but certainly not impossible. And then the Gibraltar Bridge it creates all kinds of other complexities because it's fast moving water. But again, this is, these are big projects that, mega projects that people are going to want to get their, their mind wrapped around. Um, so as automation kicks in and it starts eliminating jobs, uh, countries are going to get very nervous and they want to put money into big projects to help keep people employed. These are some of the, the big projects going on in the world today. Um, La Salle City with Qatar, this is a big one. Um, Todd Town in China, in Shanghai. Um, in Cairo, Egypt, they're um, the new Cairo capital. They're, they're actually trying to build housing for five million people there. Uh, going to dramatically change that. Uh, in Paris, they're creating U Europa City. And in Berlin, they're creating a different Europa City. Um, this is the Pearl, an island uh, off of Qatar. Um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, they have a new city master plan, over 700,000 new houses there. Um, in Tokyo, they're actually building 45 new skyscrapers in the, the Shimbuya uh, River area. Madrid, Spain, another massive project. And I love what you're doing here in Istanbul, the new city, Istanbul project. And uh, the new airport, everything I've read about the new airport says that's going to be a massive, magnificent new achievement there. In, in Africa, China is actually uh, building in a completely new city for Chinese investors that want to invest in African infrastructure. Uh, this is the, the largest uh, dam project in the world. It's a hundred billion dollars Grand Inga Dam that's going in Africa. And the country of India 
is building the tallest statue in the world. Uh, roughly an 80-story building. Um, it's Sardar Patel, one of the first prime ministers of India. To give you an idea of how large it is, you can see how that compares to some of the other statues in the world. So the era, we're, we're entering an era of mega projects. Mega projects today roughly represent 8% of global GDP. Now as I look at this, there's a number of factors that come into play, but it ver looks very much like this is going to triple over the, the, the coming oh, 15 to 20 years. And then we get into the, the whole topic of tube transportation. We hear a lot about Hyperloop. There's another one called ET3. Well, we're currently shipping more things through pipelines today than any other form of transport combined. Um, we ship oil, we ship water, sewage, so why not people and freight? Um, these are the five largest corporations that are working on solving this problem. Uh, ET3 was the one that started first. They're working on one that's much more fast and efficient. Uh, I'll show you this quick video here to give you a sense as to what we're looking at. The Hyperpod is the long-haul vehicle of the Hyperloop One system. It is a comfortable and safe transport hall for passenger and cargo pods. All levitation and guidance systems fit seamlessly underneath. Secure airlocks are at each end. Inside the hyperpod, passenger and cargo pods can glide smoothly at airline speeds right to their destination. Is that how it's going to work in the future? Um, there's lots of people working on this right now. Uh, there's teams literally all over the world trying to figure out how this is going to work, including what the inside is going to look like. Now, these go so fast that having curved sections isn't going to work very well. Um, they refer to this a lot as space travel on Earth. Uh, now, Hyperloop is large enough to actually haul shipping containers. Um, they're bus size vehicles. ET3 is much more car size. So Hyperloop travels at roughly 12, uh, 1,200 kilometers an hour. Uh, so New York to Istanbul could actually be done in eight hours. Um, ET3 will go much faster than that. It's streamlined. So New York to Istanbul in less than two hours. Um, that's really cruising quite fast, 6,000 kilometers an hour. So. The potential is for this to become the world's largest infrastructure project. Once we have some successful pilot projects, every country in the world is going to want to be tied on to this tube transportation network. It would be a 50 to 70 year build out employing uh, literally hundreds of millions of people um, in a massive investment, trillions of dollars, but it all pays for itself as it goes. So we shape the future, and then the future shapes us. We're entering a period of unprecedented opportunity. So why is this so important? It's because humanity is going to change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. But as we get more dependent on technology, risk factors are going to increase exponentially. And our children's children, who haven't even been born yet, are counting on you. They're counting on the people in this room to make great decisions. Right now is one of those moments when you are influencing the future. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this. Yeah, pretty much just like that. So I'll put in a quick plug for my new book, Epiphany Z, that's available online. 
And for more information about what we do at the Da Vinci Institute, you can sign up for our free newsletter at the, at the uh, Da Vinci Institute. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. Mr. Frey, thank you so much. I took tons of notes from your speech. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, now we, we will switch to uh, Q&A session, but uh, have you have your uh, translation? Oh. Translate it with you? Uh, I don't have okay, it with so, me. Uh, bir şey buraya? Çevir, ne derler ona? Çeviri kulaklığı. Konuşmacımız uh, için. I'll uh, ask Turkey. you in... Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll ask you in Turkish, so... Okay. That will be useful for you. Tamam. Al. Teşekkür ederim. Sağ olun. Okay. Ee, şimdi kaç sorumuz var? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ben bunları biraz da gruplamaya çalışacağım. Okay. Epey sorumuz var. Ee, soruların e, genel... İsterseniz şunu biraz daha böyle ortaya alalım. Soruların genel tonu biraz endişeli. Ee, doğal olarak e, bilmediğimiz şeyler bizi endişelendiriyor. İster istemez. Tarih boyunca da bu böyle olmuş. Ee, i̇lk sorumuz şöyle, diyor ki, e, gelecekte çok büyük bir e, nüfusla baş başa kalacağız. E, eğer bu kadar fazla meslek yok olursa, e, bu yeni nüfus için e, yeterince iş yaratabilecek miyiz? Bununla bağlantılı bir diğer soru da, özellikle sizin konuşmanızda da sıkça değindiğiniz dronelarla ilgili. Dronelar yetkinliğini bu kadar yükselttiği bir dönemde... E, Mesleklerin çoğu da yok olacak şüphesiz ama e, makinalara bu kadar e, güvenmemiz acaba e, makinalara bu kadar sorumluluk devretmemiz mantıklı mı, akıllıca mı diyor. Nasıl cevaplarsınız? Yeah. All right, great question. Um, yes, actually all of this new technology creates platforms for innovation. It creates the opportunity to create many, many new jobs, most of which we can't even envision yet because um, uh, it'll, it'll be up to the minds of the innovators. And that's, that's some of why the, the work being done by the Istanbul Chamber is so important, creating an incubator, creating an accelerator that will actually uh, stimulate uh, new, new industries. Um, this is what's going to create the jobs of the future. Now, educating people for these new jobs will be challenging because um, we have so many uh, new technologies that we'll have to train people on. We'll have to give them some idea of uh, how, to, how to work this. We have to do it in a short period of time. So we can't be using traditional colleges, which take far too long to do the retraining. We need to do that in a far faster fashion. Um, actually, I think we're, we're headed towards an era of super employment. I don't think having enough jobs is going to be the problem. Uh, I think uh, getting, getting the talent, the right talent at the right time, will be a challenge. Um, and, and so I, I, I actually think it'll be just the opposite of what most people think. Teşekkürler. <laughs> okay. Bir diğer tartışma da bununla alakasız, e, bunu, pardon bununla bağlantılı olarak e, esasında yaratılan yeni işlerin e, bugünkü e, kadar ekonomik değer yaratıp yaratmayacağı. Yani şey, şöyle söyleyeyim, bugünün bir e, fabrika çalışanı e, maaşıyla 10 birimlik bir yaşam standartına ulaşabiliyorken, gelecekte edineceği işle yine 10 birimlik bir yaşam standartı alabilecek mi? Ama bu işte universal basic income gibi bir sürü başka tartışmayı da getiriyor. Ama teşekkür ediyorum. Siz de kapsadınız. Ee, peki şimdi bir soru vardı. Onu diğer oturuma aktarıyorum. İçinden seçtiğim bir soruyu. Dolayısıyla onu unutmadım. Soramazsam kırılmasın. Ee, şöyle ilginç bir soru var. Diyor ki bütün bu çizdiğiniz portrelerin yanı sıra bir de yıkıcı küresel gerilimler, işte savaşlar vesaire var. Bütün bunlar bu çizdiğiniz geleceği nasıl etkileyecek? Bozabilir mi bütün bu büyüyü? Um, yeah, so to, um, to talk to your first question about Will it provide enough income for people to actually make a, a good living? Um, one, one of the big trends um, that we're seeing in the United States is we're not creating uh, uh, full-time jobs, we're creating 
uh, project-based work. So the internet is a very sophisticated communications tool and enables us to align the talent of a business, uh, the talent of individuals with the needs of a business in far more precise ways. So rather than hiring somebody on for a full-time job, we bring them on for two months or two weeks or two days or even two hours. Um, so a lot of people will be working as what we call free agents or freelancers, uh, and they'll be doing project type work. Now, as they get good at this, uh, they will actually command a much higher salary than in the past. Um, freelancers who are good freelancers actually can say no to the things that they're not good at, say yes to the things that they're good at, and will actually be able to focus their, their, their career and take control of their own destiny. So how about the global crisis and wars and battles and so on? How will it affect the feature that you described? Um, the, well, uh, wars, wars always affect things in interesting and different ways. Um, so those are some of the wild card things that we can't, we can't anticipate. Um, now every, every war in the future will start as a cyber war. Um, and, and so uh, some of the big responsibilities of countries is to uh, somehow resolve conflict, to mitigate conflict. And, and uh, to the extent that we can create better systems for resolving conflict in the future, that will uh, hopefully start diffusing a lot of these problems. But we're still not there yet, so no. that's, I'm speculating. Okay. <laughs> um, şimdi çok sayıda soru geldi. Onun için daha da hızlanarak devam edelim. Bunlarla bağlantılı bir diğer soru böyle sıraladım ben de. Deniyor ki çocukların eğitimi ne yönde evrilecek? Geleceğin eğitim süresi bu kadar uzun olacak mı? Ve diploma bugünkü kadar önemli bir şey olmaya devam edecek mi? Um, so education is a great topic. As we uh, apply artificial intelligence to teacher bots, teacher bots will be able to, to learn who we are as individuals and will be able to teach us far faster than any time in the past. So um, we'll probably be able to learn uh, two times faster, four times faster, maybe even 10 times faster than in the past. Um, so, but there's no one size fits all formula for education. So if you're learning to become a bricklayer, you actually have to lay bricks. Um, so you can't learn everything through a computer. But with a teacher bot, the teacher will learn, the teacher bot will know what skills you have, what you're deficient in, and what it'll take to get you up to speed with that new skill. Yine bağlantılı bir konu. Diyor ki, her zaman ihtiyaç olarak varlığını sürdürecek meslekler hangileri olacak? Um, well, there, there will be a lot of uh, consistent jobs. I mean, just... Like Chino speakers. <laughs> uh, uh, just being a cleaner, cleaning a house, cleaning a building is a complicated task. Now, we'll be able to, to, to train robots on how to do something like that. But if they come across a piece of paper, how do they know that this is a piece of trash or it could be a valuable piece of paper. It could be money, it could be a birth certificate, it could be something valuable. So we'll have to train, um, train these machines. And then when we start training these machines, we start training it with human bias and everything. So mm -hmm. um, there's lots of uh, simple jobs that'll still be uh, a long time into the future, just because it's really hard to, to train kind of all these, mm -hmm. these little decision-making things that would go on in our head to do that job. Bir diğer soru şöyle diyor. Ee, geleceğin dünyasında her işi e, makinelere ya da siber çözümlere taşımayı düşünürken en büyük elektronik şirketlerden biri olan Amazon mağazalar açmaya başladı. E, dükkanlar açıyor, müşteriler çekmeye çalışıyor. Bu kendisiyle ve çizdiğimiz dünyayla çelişmiyor mu? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. Amazon seems to be trying to take over the world, and so uh, everybody's following their lead. 
um, so there, there are certain things that don't lend themselves well to being sold online. Um, if, I'm, if I'm wanting to, to buy fruit, I want to pick out what fruit looks good. Uh, there's lots of things in grocery stores that we want, um, that we don't know that we want until we get there. So that becomes kind of a, a central gathering place for us. Now anything that's a commodity is much easier sold online. And so we're, we're, we're starting to understand better what things work to be sold online and what things don't. Mm -hmm. Ee, bir diğer soru şunu soruyor. Robotlarla insanlar arasındaki en temel fark ne olacak? Çünkü iki tarafta birbirine benzemek için epey çaba sarf ediyor. Um, what, one of the biggest differences with a robot is a robot is um, see, human beings uh, understand the value of things around it. I mean, we as an individual will place uh, an emotional value on a lamp, on a chair, on carpet, on the wall, and pictures on the wall, and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for a machine to have any emotional attachment to, to understand that emotional value that we as humans place on those things. And so that's one of the key differences, and that's one of the big challenges for uh, artificial intelligence is to understand what's important to us and uh, why it should be important to them. Üç sorum daha kaldı fakat süremizi doldurduk. Ben izleyicilerimizin müsaadesiyle konuklarımız burada bizlerle olmaya devam edecek gün boyunca. Belki fuaya alanında yakalarsanız sorarsınız. Şu yönden içim rahat. Sorular İngilizce yazılmıştı. Dolayısıyla soran kişinin E, bizzat kendisini de sorabileceğini düşünerek söylüyorum. Şimdi 15 dakikalık bir e, aramız, molamız olacak. Ardından ekonomi ve finanstan e, insana gelecek dünya başlıklı konuşmasıyla Hamish McRae'yi burada ağırlayacağız. Afiyet olsun şimdi. <gülüyor>